Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian Zane, and welcome to the Inner Voice Show, the show that's about you and everything that matters to you. And we look at it from a psychological perspective with guests, with lecturers, with people who are an expert in the field of psychology. And today I'm so excited to have Dr. Roberta Shaler, who's a relationship consultant. She's been a guest um, at this show before, and if you want to see the previous show that she was here, go ahead to my website that you see on the uh, screen and go to the YouTube channel, and uh, you will get to see her. We're going to talk about relationships, relationships with really hard people, and I'm sure most of you probably had that experience in your life, or you know someone who is very difficult to be in relationship with. So stay tuned and we're going to be back with Dr. Roberta Shaler. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian Zane and welcome to Inner Voice Show. On this episode, we're going to talk about relationship finances and a whole lot more. So stay tuned. Hi, I'm Dr. Fujian Zane. I'm a psychotherapist. I'm an author and an international speaker. I have hosted my own television show, Inner Voice, in a satellite program for 16 years. Whether it's premarital counseling or through their marriage, how to deal with children, and if they're going through a divorce, to teach them how to communicate better together. In actuality, I think my job is very important to work with individuals and the couples in order to make the most important relationship of their life healthy, which makes them healthy. On my Inner Voice show, I actually interview some of the prominent psychologists and entertainers in English, and I also speak to some of the psychotherapists who are Iranians and the artists who are Iranians, and I speak in Persian to the Persian population around the world, from Iran or Europe or Japan, Australia, all over the United States and Canada, because obviously I was born in Iran. Where's Dr. Zane? Dr. Zane? Hello. Um, you also have been trained in my specific methodology and techniques, correct? Yes. Are you willing to talk to her after, the, after this show? Absolutely. And, and, and tell her the step-by-step -step that she needs to do with deal with what I believe is an addictive personality? Yes, absolutely. The family goes through a lot. For boys who are becoming girls, the fathers of the family suffer. They will keep being confused. They look at the, all the childhood pictures that they've took of their son, and now they look at somebody who's standing in front of them as supposed to be their daughter. Coming up, I'm going to be talking to a psychotherapist about awareness integration model. You really want to know what that is, huh? Coming up, stay tuned. Hi, I'm Dr. Fujian Zain, psychotherapist, and I'm here with Nasreen Bafordari, licensed marriage and family therapist. We're going to talk about awareness integration model, a psychological model that I have originated, and Nasreen Bafordari is one of the first therapists who has actually learned and has been utilizing it with her clients. Thank you for coming. Thank you for inviting me. This is an honor. Some of the major topics that I actually talk to my clients who are couples uh, are first talking about sexuality. Many people don't know how to talk about sex. Concept of communication about it is something that I actually have to teach the couples and how to do. We talk about sexuality. Many people um, come into their sexuality in a very automatic way. We can go through the whole experience and wham, have a great time. But being with another human being, it actually takes skills. So becoming aware of every area of, um, of how we think, how we behave, how we feel, how we communicate with another human being in order to have an amazing sexuality is part of what we also teach in this AI model. So much of our sexuality. People don't talk about finances a lot. They don't have a system. They come from two backgrounds of how they actually have created their finances and I have to help them create a system and have a great communication in how to follow the system. Another main topic is when they actually have children. Now remember, 
two people, two backgrounds, two cultures, two sets of values are coming in and now they actually have to bring those together and that's where they need how to communicate, be flexible and really negotiate on one way of handling their kids. Duet, sometimes you guys are entering each yes. other's space yes. and singing together yes. and then solo. How does that ex have well, experience for you? The funny thing is in-laws, we have to deal with them. They're always there. They're going to be there. We didn't marry them, but they came with the package. So somehow we have to really, really work with them. And if I have to actually add one more topic that I've had to deal with a lot of couples and individuals is addiction. Whether it's an addiction to alcohol or drugs, pornography, cell phone, computers, is one aspect that really, really affects the person's life and in their relationship. With people who are going through recovery from addiction, they've had some sort of a trauma in their childhood. And when we've worked with the awareness integration model with them, clearing the trauma, the choice and the chance for them to relapsing has really minimized. I have been in the field of psychology for about 25 years. I started with uh, seminars in ontology and psychology almost the same time. And I know you were part of the pilot study that we did and in the result of that pilot study was that people were actually minimizing the depression 76 percent. They were minimizing anxiety 64 percent and their self-esteem was rising about 43 percent. Now those are astonishing um, numbers. You know I uh, wanted to go through it. I wanted to experience what my clients would experience. So I ask you to work on me as a model for the group that was being trained. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. If you like what you see, you can see more on my website and my YouTube channel. And if you want to contact me, I'm on Facebook and Twitter. Bye-bye. Welcome back everyone and welcome back. Thank Dr. you so Taylor. much. It's Great to have to you. Be here. Yes. So I was um, letting people know that this is the second time that you've been here. So first that uh, you came for one of your books and now we're going for the 17th book, I think. 16th. 16th. She's the mm -hmm. author of 16th, 16th book. And you can um, see all of her books in her website, which is actually on the, um, you can see it on the screen. So um, I know that you have been a therapist, you have been a consultant for many companies and you see clients and you see couples and individuals and um, you have more and more brought yourself into being an expert with um, people who are really hard to deal with in relationships. Um, I've been a therapist and a marriage and family um, therapist for about 25 years and many times we work with people in dealing with their communication skills and you know many of their issues that also come from the past and the way they've been raised and they bring that into a relationship and how to negotiate. But it's really hard to do all of that when someone has some sort of a character issue and they repeatedly with their pattern bring all of those and feed into the relationship whether they're mm -hmm. married or they're divorced yes. and you've really found your niche in this so tell us well I make a distinction which is probably helpful to people listening between difficult people and chronically difficult yes. people a difficult person is having a bad day, a life event, stress, short-term job loss, somebody died. They're difficult, they're short, they're abrupt, they're not available. But a chronically difficult person is someone who is going to have difficulty with most people most of the time. They're the kind of people when you say, oh, I'm going home for Christmas, you go, oh, that person will be there, <laughs> right? And, and everybody finds and them anxiety difficult. anxiety comes in immediately. That's right, because they're chronically difficult. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is that they have a very fragile mm -hmm. ego, so they're, they're very armored, and they push everything onto other people and away from themselves because they are so fragile that if they ever did not have that armor they would shatter and they know it subconsciously so they're always on the defensive offensive pick one it doesn't matter but they're going to be there so that's why I call them chronically difficult and there's one little adjunct to that mm -hmm that sometimes they're chronically difficult at home in their social life, right. but they'll shine at work. 
Very true. They had they completely utilize different types of skills when it comes to work environment versus the area of intimacy and where they have to be accountable and responsible and be close to someone and attached. The the less intelligent ones mm -hmm. will also do it at work. <laughs> okay. But the really <laughs> clever, intelligent, manipulative, exploitive ones will very carefully choose where they allow this to escape. <laughs> now you've actually kind of coined the term hijackers. Hijackal. Hijackal. So let's tell the audience what that means. Well, it's AKA a chronically difficult person, but the definition of a hijackal is a person who hijacks a relationship for their own purposes to scavenge it for power, status, and control. Got it. So they're constantly scavenging. They want some power, always power. They want status, maybe by being next to you and then they'll take control of you. They want control of everything. And it's because of their fear. Their mm -hmm. abject fear that if they're not in control, that shield will come down, they will get shattered. Been there. So, <laughs> totally experienced. And the part is that even if you wanted to remove yourself from that experience and that relationship, uh, it doesn't stop. So many times people have tried to say, okay, I've gone into the relationship, I've tried, so at one point I'm trying to get out of this relationship, but the relation, this person does not let you go out of the relationship. They Never. will continue with the drama and the trauma that they actually create, and they're, um, that's what they get fed by. Oh yes, and you know, I was speaking this morning with a family law attorney and I said, you know, it's the gift that keeps giving if you happen to be the attorney of a hijackal because they want control over their ex forever. Mm -hmm. I once worked, well I have many people in my practice, but I think about one woman in particular. They had been divorced for 12 years, they had three children together, he had been remarried for five years, she was still getting 10 to 12 emails a day. Mm -hmm. And still you know why it's an attorney's dream is there's going to be an ex parte around every corner. Right. Right. It because that need for control, that need to be in charge, that need to never let that person go or let that person have latitude or escape or be right. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on. Now you wrote two books. One books uh, one book came out when in October mm -hmm. and now you're on the uh, second book on that. So what's the difference between the books so that uh, as our audience want to go purchase them they have an idea. So give me the name of the books and then what's the difference between those sure. two. Sure. The book that I put out in October is called The Hijackal Trap. Mm -hmm. uh, passive Aggressive Edition. So <laughs> it talks about hijackals in the context of passive aggressive people. Okay. And I wrote another book on passive aggression called Stop That's Crazy Making, How to Quit Playing the Passive Aggressive Game. So those two go together. But the book that's, that's coming out in March is called Escaping the Hijackal Trap, Loving Someone Who Shoves You Away Yet Demands That You Stay. Mm. And that's what happens. You get this push-pull all the time. I hate you, don't leave me. Mm -hmm. Right? That's constant with them. And so they think they can act out badly. And if you have the nerve to say, I'm done, mm -hmm. then they're all over you. Like, oh, I'm so sorry. I would not I would never be able to live without you. I didn't mean that. And as soon as you say, oh, well, that's all right. I'll stay. Then they say, three days later, you're the scum of the earth. Well, sometimes also, um, Dr. Shaler, we I've experienced people who they don't tell you uh, I hate you. What they do is I love you, I love you. You're you're the one. You're this. You're that. And then their behavior is that they're chronic cheaters, or they manipulate, or they lie, or they control the finances and they shift the finances in a way that they're controlling it so you won't know. Um, they will do everything impossible in their life that they know it would upset you in the relationship. And you can sit down with them and let them know that these are our agreement. Do you agree? If you don't, it's okay. I'm leaving. No, no, no. I agree. Absolutely. It's not going to happen again. Or it never happened. It could be completely in <laughs> denial true. anyway or, or not in denial but actually lying about it. And they will go through all of this to keep you but their behavior will be all of the uh, what I mentioned. So the same concept of go away stay, go away, stay is there, but in another format. Very covert. Very covert. Uh, in my consulting room in Escondido, I have a big sign in gold letters on the wall, 12-inch gold letters, and it's the most important thing I can teach anyone. 
And what it says is the truth is what you do. Mm -hmm. And I explain that as your behavior is your belief. Whatever comes from your mouth, if it doesn't match your behavior, believe the behavior. And that's probably the biggest gift that I give some of my clients is to be able to make that distinction between what's coming from the mouth and what's actually being demonstrated in the actions. Exactly. And there, there, there is this dichotomy that goes on all the time because one of the hallmarks of a hijackal is they must win in the moment to keep that fragile ego, ego safe. Mm -hmm. So if I have to say black to win here and 20 minutes later I have to say white to win, and I will do it if I'm a hijackal. And if you call me on it, I will deny that I said black 20 right. minutes ago because I must win in the moment. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard a politician on the news the other day on a call in, and they, they called him to talk with him. And he's quite prominent at the moment. And they were calling him. They actually played the clips <laughs> of what he said. <laughs> and he said, No, I didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> right, we have that almost every day with that politician. <laughs> I guess. So there's a good demonstration right now. If anybody is wondering what a hijackal <laughs> looks like, there you have it. <laughs> now, it's really, really crazy making for the person who goes into a relationship because I think that there's a charming effect at the beginning and that charm lowers you in because I think part of that piece is how, t you know, the game of control from a person who wants that type of a control is that they they observe and they get how to do the game of charming to get you so it's very crazy making for the person who goes into a relationship and then they're played with uh, they're enraged because there's an insult to their intelligence they are uh, there's a part of them that enjoys this mysterious game there's a part of them that um, wants to believe the best and keeps yeah. holding on to any glimpse of the best because I, I don't think any of us really wants to feel I'm a fool or I was fooled so even the, t the part of our denial yeah. that doesn't want right. to you know doesn't want to think that it keeps hoping for the best that no 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 it, I wasn't fooled he's not that bad or she's not that bad it must be that I'm not catching on to something and it keeps going and going and going and then the rage happens almost instantly um, and it keeps happening for, for both sides. Yeah, well we really want to believe that we are wonderful and beautiful and magic and the best thing that ever happened to them. And we like to hear those things. We yeah. love to hear those things. Whether we're male or female, we love to hear those mm -hmm. things. And so when somebody's behavior doesn't match their words, we tend to justify and rationalize oh she's having a bad day or oh he's he's had difficulties at work or whatever and yes that occurs but those are difficult people not chronically difficult people chronically difficult people have a lot of bad days in that context <laughs> <laughs> right and that that's the difficulty and what you said i mean they're charming they're manipulative they're seductive I mean, even in a therapeutic situation, I have had hijackals come in with their partners. They come in to seduce me to their side of the issue. And if you're not really aware of all these things, you can go along with that because it is so flattering, so right. easy, so, so um, reinforcing to you and affirming to you. Mm -hmm. So sometimes people have huge frustrations in even going for help. Mm -hmm. And they're saying, ah, now the therapist is on the hijackal side. Mm -hmm. Isn't anybody going to see this? So it's very insidious. It's just hidden. And, and like you said, they will say one thing and do another. And you constantly have to be believing that behavior. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you really don't want to. Mm -hmm. You really don't want to believe it because the wake-up call means... I have to take action. And there's a chapter in Escaping the Hijackal Trap called The Gotcha Factor. <laughs> and what that is, is that they will go for you and go for you and go for you in whatever manipulative, seductive, charming, wonderful, generous ways they need mm -hmm. to, until they get you. And every day after that is a gotcha. 
And I've seen two um, forms, and I'm sure you've seen many, many different forms. One form, and the two different extremes. One form is uh, the the type of a person who are victimized so they're dramatic and and victimize themselves so when they come to therapy we have to also calm them down because they're the one who are consistently taking on the space and time and the whether it's their rage or victimization or poor me um, you know help me help me poor me that at one point a lot of the uh, the time and effort goes toward them where the one who's getting actually hijacked stays back and feels that I'm not being taken care of and all the attention is going to that person. The other side that I've seen is the the person who does it passive aggressively and cheats in a, in a different way and verbally tries to calm the other person while their action doesn't. So then they will get the other person enraged. And then tell them it's their fault. And then tell them it's their <laughs> fault. Yeah. So it's these two extremes I've seen. Uh, do you want to explain more of the types? Or? Well, you know, there are a few things that we can help people understand yes. about hijackals. First of all, the need to win. We've yeah. talked about that, so that's number one. The second is what we call all or nothing thinking or black mm -hmm. and white thinking. So when you're doing what I want you to do, you are wonderful. You are God's gift to me. When you question my authority, you question my needs and wants, you question my actions, you are the most suspicious, horrible person that ever came into my life, and I don't know why I bother with you. Right. It's that it's your flip. Issue. It's yeah. always put back on you. And so we have, we have the need to win, and we have black and white thinking, and then we have extreme emotions. If I'm not getting what I want, I will cry if I'm a hijackal, <laughs> I will cry, I will yell, I will stomp out, I will Threat. I will threaten you, I will um, abandon you for a while to mm -hmm. hope that you're going to straighten up and come to my side. Punish you. Yeah, so we have extreme emotions, mm -hmm. usually much larger than the situation mm -hmm. requires for anybody. And what goes with the winning is the other side of it. It will always be your fault. No matter what's going on, mm -hmm. a hijack will always make it your fault. Mm -hmm. So some people will take that on for quite a while. Some people will look at it and say, well, it may be my fault. And we do have to talk about the differential between men and women. Because a woman being uh, in relationship with a hijackal has been a cultured to nourish and yes. nurture and take care and we have the feeling that in order to do that we just need to be more patient more kind more compassionate more loving so and I keep changing our behavior in order to get uh, the approval from them and that's a lovely way of saying turning yourself into a pretzel yes yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and so that that occurs and occurs and occurs and Eventually, you are this pretzel, and you're completely worn out, and you're also beaten down. And so now, what do you do? Now you're in a situation where you honestly believe that you're flawed, mm -hmm. and then you need help. Mm -hmm. And then you go to that situation that you just spoke of, where the hijacker comes in and is eloquent about all your faults. The therapist seems to be listening to the hijacker, mm -hmm. and there you are, victimized again in the therapy situation. Mm -hmm. So it's very important if these things are happening that you go to someone like you and I who recognizes these things. And, and it's not that other people don't know about them, it's that they're not with them frequently enough to understand the path. Right. It, there needs to be a particular level of listening to um, to recognize those types of very, very intense manipulations that are happening and the dynamic that happens between the couple to recognize. Although we still sometimes, as a therapist, I know for me, I still would have to handle and bring down the emotionality of the room before I can handle anything. So we would still probably deal with uh, the person who is being victimized just to calm down the victimization in order to handle what the root cause is. Um, but it's very important uh, to go to a specialist because many times the people who are um, hijackers, they know how to manipulate everyone around them. And many times even if they go to a therapist that they can't manipulate, uh, usually drop off or say they don't understand. Or they do another out. lovely thing. 
they do their extreme emotion in the therapy room. So they get up and they, I'm not standing for this, and they run out. And at that point, then I reach to the other part and say, no, don't get up, don't go after them, because that's just what they want. Right. They'll be back, because they cannot bear to not know what's going on in this room. Exactly. And I want to say something about uh, something you just brought up. One of the things that hijackals are very good at is what we call emotional facts. So they take a fact, they add an emotion, and then they, they present it as true. Mm -hmm. So it could be something like uh, they'll say to the judge, she doesn't bring the children back on time, and she does that just to get back at me. Mm -hmm. And so now it is that on the Intentionality on beside the, the fact. That's right. But the emotional fact is that she disrespects me and is out to get me. Now, the fact is that the child's soccer game went over 15 minutes longer, but we're not talking about the facts anymore. We're talking about the emotional facts. Mm -hmm. And when you go to court, and sometimes I go to court for my clients and speak, on, speak to the issues, um, that comes out all the time because a judge does not have the present nature of the pattern in front of them all the time. So they see this snapshot, they may see the snapshot over and over, but it's always in a volatile place when they come to court. It's an ex parte hearing or something to do with the divorce. Mm -hmm. An issue that you really need help with again, because uh, I work with attorneys to, to and sometimes the clients of uh, my clients' attorneys to, to say, all right, here was an emotional fact. Here was an emotional fact. Look at it in the record. When that happens, you have to jump up and say. That's not a fact. The fact is that the children's game went over 15 minutes later. That's the fact. It has nothing to do with spite or disrespect. Mm -hmm. Right? So when you're feeling beaten down by a hijackal, these emotional facts keep coming out, and you're sitting there going, yeah, but, yeah, but, yeah, but. No, that's not how it was. That's not what I meant. That's not what I said. And so you keep going into a defensive mode. Yes, and you just feel like eventually you're just overwhelmed by the hijackal behavior. Right. Um, what I've noticed a lot is that they both have different kinds of rage inside of them. So one is a rage that is um, internally and is constantly there because it comes from that winning concept. E they either want to win and they'll use their rage in order to win or they'll do it covertly uh, if they can do it outside and they uh, internally they do it so that they can maneuver and control in a different way. But the same rage transfers to the other person who mm -hmm. is being maneuvered and controlled um, because at one point if they're going to feel Def always defending and then defenseless and then um, helpless and powerless against this way of manipulating and uh, moving, you know, constantly. And um, so after a while, this whole relationship becomes about rage. Love goes away. The whole thing is rage. That's right. And where do you begin? You know, one of the things would probably help to talk about is how does a person become a hijackal? Mm -hmm. And what happens is something occurred in this person's life, early in their life, usually before they had language, but somewhere up to the age of 12, 14. And there could be a lot of siblings mm -hmm. that it weren't affected by it. It's something unique to the person that they took in as a trauma. And when they did that, they started learning how to get that defensive wall up mm -hmm. in order to keep that fragile ego safe. Mm -hmm. And so they just stepped into this behavior and stepped into this behavior. It could be that they had uh, abusive parents, which is obvious, but it could be a passive-aggressive parent. It could be an um, unattached parent. It could be an event that occurred. It could be family dynamic. Maybe it only affected them. There's no should or right answer to this. But they will not consider the fact that they are the cause of the pain. It is always someone else's fault because they have to keep themselves intact. So it's very, very helpful to have some compassion for the fact this person did not set out to be this way very purposefully and consciously. This has been an, an unconscious development over time in order to survive and to make sense of survival in terms of the, of the trauma. And so I developed the, the idea that we not only have to be compassionate, 
because we hear about that all the time right. in our world you know that's such a wonderful thing to be we should all be giving compassion but what is important I think is what I coined as a field is inclusive compassion and we don't hear a lot about that because inclusive compassion means be compassionate for others while being compassionate for to yourself. yourself. Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's the piece that often finally makes sense to someone who's in a relationship with a hijackal that they're not including themselves in the compassion. One of the things that we have in our culture is saying that we have that is just startling if you stop and think about it. We have a saying, give until it hurts. <laughs> now what kind of sense can that possibly mean and put that in the context of loving and loving and loving and loving till you are so damaged yeah you become a doormat well yes and and you know maybe maybe the the under part of the doormat <laughs> you know mm -hmm. it's just you just keep subjugating yourself to whatever this hijackal needs or wants or whatever you start believing the press that he or she is giving you right. and so you must include yourself in the compassion the other part uh, to add to what you were saying is um, also learning how to set boundaries and I know that mm -hmm. for someone like that if you set boundaries for them they probably get more enraged they will up the uh, the type of control and manipulation that they do at the beginning so for someone who's not ready or doesn't know how to necessarily put a boundary even if they get strong enough to put one boundary because they uh, the hijack kind of raises it um, they go back and go oh okay and then they'll go back into defenselessness and defending themselves. So um, the part of learning how to structure and set boundaries and maintain the boundaries in a place that the person can feel strong enough here where you know it doesn't shatter and then raise it and then raise it. Um, and I've noticed that the other uh, the hijackals um, game changes because they can't handle boundaries because they're not in control at that moment mm -hmm. and their game keeps changing. And but sometimes when you learn how to set that boundary, you become powerful inside. The person who is with the person who's hijacked and gone through so much manipulation, a systematic boundary that is set, which is more of respect to themselves. Like, you know, I love you and I know this is what you want, but this doesn't work for me, so I'm not going to do it. Or please don't talk to me this way and when you talk to me this way I need to leave the room and then come back so very systematic but then you just keep saying it like a mantra you keep getting more powerful about that level of boundary setting and then you raise it it makes people feel powerful after a while and then they can deal with it in a different way and I think the hijackal will also at one point keep pushing through those boundaries and when they get it that they can't move it um, they will also um, shift at least that behavior and then the behaviors will keep changing and the boundaries will keep changing. What do you think about the concept of boundary setting? Well I think boundary setting is essential for every human being. I think that we should teach that in school, mm -hmm. you know, early on. But you're right, you know, it's difficult for the person, the non hijackal to actually set a boundary and hold a boundary because the the small boundary that they put is met with a tsunami that wants to knock it over but what I tell my clients and you likely do too is take the gift from this relationship work on yourself mm -hmm. learn what it is that you've been accepting what you've been willing to put up with where that came from why that's so what do you really want now you know, we have seven inalienable rights that are in healthy families developed as we grow. Right. And if we don't develop those seven rights because we weren't in a healthy family, we're going to have an excess or a deficiency in each one of them. And what's important is to go back and, and look at them again now as an adult. Because if you don't feel that you have the right to be here, for instance, the most basic right in the world, and then someone keeps telling you, who do you think you are? Mm -hmm you end up with a deficiency in the right to be here or if you don't feel you have the right to speak right all of these things so it sounds a little bit crazy but it's a gift if you take it that way that all right now I've woken up I see that there are hijackal patterns that are happening I'm not going to deal with the hijackal I'm going to deal with me I'm going to do that learning within myself. I'm going to learn to set those boundaries gently because one of the things we have to be with hijackals 
is not only authentic, but we must be strategic. Very. And it doesn't often come naturally to people who have been part of the hijackal codependent mix. The problem uh, with, with that way of uh, being strategic many times, Dr. Shaler, is because I think that people don't go into relationships and ma uh, marriages to be strategic. It's like sometimes mm -hmm. when you said when somebody is um, smart enough they can shift from one the area of work and then relationship, many times when we're in our work environment, in our business environment, we are strategic. Like we do what we need to do, we look at the next right. step, we look at how we're supposed to present ourselves, how we're supposed to communicate in order to get to where we want. And many times in our relationships we're not. We don't look at where is it that I want to get. Even the places we want to get most of the time is being loved, being loving, being authentic, being transparent, being all of that. So it's like that type of a close intimacy that we want that anything happens we shift ourselves to get that. But when we go into this game of survival because one person in the game is constantly not only surviving but trying to control and uh, makes everything into a survival game, then that the person who came into a relationship with this hope of unity and transparency and, and vulnerability, vulnerability and, safety. and safety, they you know they get shocked and it's like what the hell did I come into a relationship for <laughs> if this was going to be a war zone and I always had to you know have my guards up what's the point and then what's the point for me to have those guards up and then try to have be to try to be vulnerable when I'm having sex with them or you know putting myself up and then it's just that whole the whole concept of a relationship breaks because now we're just in two teams trying to survive each other you're so right I mean, it's, it's so mind-boggling to people who find themselves in that situation when they finally wake up and say, I'm in this situation. Mm -hmm. When I really paint the picture for myself or for somebody else, this is what happens, this is what gets said, this is what gets done. And you kind of, s I see clients go, oh my goodness, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that's not right, is it? You know, and they have that moment when they realize that I have been, backing off and, and beaten down and I've been accepting all these things that I shouldn't do and I'm being submerged yeah. by this. And so there's that moment when you have to say you deserve to survive. You deserve to be assertive. You deserve to be able to say and be heard when you talk about what you think, what you feel, what you need, what you want. And those are very basic rights in a relationship. And when you recognize that those four things are not even allowed, because I'll tell you what you think, exactly. and I'll tell you how you feel. You know, isn't it the most transgressing thing when you, s when you feel close to someone and you say, you know, I really feel this way. I'm a little vulnerable, but I really feel like this. And you think there's this golden moment with your partner and they cannot let you have that at all. They say, you shouldn't feel like this. <laughs> you know, and the startling reality that I was sharing my feelings, not asking for permission to feel them. Right. Right? And we sometimes get into that box when we're with a hijackal. They, they've slowly told us what we think and what we feel. And we may not agree with them, but we're tired. We're, we're exhausted from saying, no, you're wrong, or that's not right, or whatever. Finally, we'll, oh, whatever. Mm -hmm. And another thing that I really want us to talk about is the effect on the children. Please. Because remember that children don't have, and, and I'm, I know you remember, but we all need to remember, that children don't have language. Right. So they just feel the room. They are taking everything in through their senses. You know, it's not that they that they love the idea of eating everything, they're taking in the solidity, the density, this is soft, this is hard, you know, they're taking it all in. So they're taking in your emotions, they're taking in the way you stand, they're taking in your facial expressions, the tone of your voice. You know, haven't you often looked at a little child and you say, oh, look at that, they stand just like their father. Well, of course, the child's been studying standing like daddy for, since a, long he, for a long time. So you're teaching that child how to be in a relationship, how to be a man or a woman, 
I used to teach a lot of parenting classes and I would say to these young parents, you know, I hope you really enjoyed those three minutes of conception because for the rest <laughs> of your life you have undertaken how to demonstrate how to be a man, how to be a woman, and how to be a man and a woman in a relationship. Yeah. And they're horrified because they don't realize that. And we do a lot of damage up until the age of seven. You know, when we the prefrontal lobes really start to develop and we have reason and logic, up until then, these little children are very aware that they're not like goats and, and cows and horses. They don't get spit out, licked off, and they leap up and jump around the meadow. I mean, we are helpless lumps, and we really need the giants to survive. Exactly. So from an emotional point of view, we're just feeling it all out. And that's where we get our sense of what's okay, am I okay? Do I have the right to be here? Do I have the right to feel my feelings? And the child who's uh, getting raised in this environment, the first thing they also know is they have to survive the emotional piece that is happening outside. So they also... Uh, go into a survival mode um, in front of their own parents who supposedly it's the most safest place it should be for them in order to grow. So they grow up with hell of a lot of anxiety inside of them and because of that anxiety they also um, live in a, a survival mode consistently and they, like you said, role model from both parents. So whatever they see as this theater in front of them Parts of them picks up this one as power, parts of them picks up this one as being powerless. And they, uh, what, what they see outside plays inside of mm -hmm. them consistently with each other. Sure, and then they start going into the outer world and they start playing it out. Exactly. And that gets very distressing mm -hmm. because what's out there is not what's in the home. How, and they learn to behave and cope out there and it's different than in here. They get very confused and then they get give those mixed messages as they begin to date and they're looking for the wrong things because they're actually uh, from an internal place looking to replicate relationships with the people that raised them mm -hmm. and so if they've had a hijackal they will be attracted to a hijackal because it's familiar exactly exactly and they continue doing that pattern all over their life yes yeah. and and it's it's such a joy mm -hmm. to have a client come in who, who sees the patterns and will do the learning themselves and then will try being strategic, mm -hmm. not making ultimatums and leaving hijackals, taking the most from the relationship to grow the best way they possibly can, the healthiest way they can, apply these things strategically to their relationship, see what the change that can occur, calibrate it if it's never enough, then you know you probably have to leave. But the caveat there is the children. And I've become a bit of the voice for the children right. in the sense that it's a very difficult thing to say, if you don't do your own work and all the things that I just said, um, you're going to leave and probably the child is going to have 50% or more time with a hijackal with the way that hijackals manipulate courtrooms. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be there to moderate that behavior. So there are huge considerations before divorcing if right. you have children. And I think we've been talking a lot to the uh, survivors of the hijackals or the people who are the, in the relationship and tolerating. Um, I would also want, if you know someone or if you are one and you really get that that's how you play in, in uh, the relationship, to also know that you're suffering, although it appears that you're in control in the game, but you're suffering because you don't allow yourself to feel that love and vulnerability and to be intimate and to feel that safety in a relationship that you can without always having to manipulate. So, and that is an amazing experience to have when you are in a relationship that you've chosen and you can bring your walls down. So um, if you're out there and hearing it, um, it's a good chance for you to also go to therapy, to go to consultation with someone who's an expert, to really, really work through those traumas and experiences that, uh, you know, people have had in, in childhood, to heal through those and be able to have a really a nurturing, safe environment for yourself and relationship, because you also deserve it, you're also worth it to do that. And, and 
like you said, because we're a role model for our children, look at the impact and the responsibility that you have toward your children and how you also working on yourself will support the shift that happens inside of you and for the, your next generation. So if it's um, if it's the, if if you're listening and you are the part of the, the the hijackal yourself or you are in a relationship with one um, please go to uh, for relationship help.com as you can see it on the screen and uh, please go and order the books some of them are online books some of them are um, actual print books right mm -hmm. and and the new book is coming out in March the new book is coming out in March and um, so go ahead and read and then you can also contact Dr. Shaler um, and um, you know any questions you have if you wanted to meet with her and um, work on yourself because this is, you owe it to yourself and your relationship here in this lifetime and for your next generation to create a beautiful relationship for yourself. And don't let distance be a problem. I have clients all over yeah. that I see through the internet. So it isn't geographically undesirable to be somewhere other than where I am. <laughs> yeah, I do coaching all over the world, from Australia, from Japan, anywhere in the world. Right. So technology has really supported us to do this type of consultation and coaching. and. Um, take care of yourself and 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 the now there are tools and uh, definitely to be able to support you thank you so much for coming i know you come from very far a lot of traffic from uh, <laughs> san diego to los angeles and uh, you do that every couple of months to come in and share with us the new findings that you have and the new book so thank you well thank you it's always great to have a conversation with you and I know that this series it's a series now that you've created so hopefully we'll have you back with the next series yeah of, the of first the first month. part of the series comes out in March it will keep coming out every two weeks okay. so that you'll have all the different pieces so you can find exactly what you need oh that's awesome that's really exciting thank you all of you for being with us and until next week create a wonderful life for yourself